little spooky, isn't it, Tina? It is a little spooky. Yeah, a little
salted caramel whiskey. It also has ginger beer and the lime. And I'm going to tell you what, that is really, really, really good. A guy named William Wilcher was hanged for the murder of Henry Smith. The last hanging took place. In fact, we're behind what used to be the old jailhouse. This was the old jailhouse up until 1987. I haven't been in it since then. <laughs> but that was the 80s, okay? 80s was a crazy time. Now, uh, okay, now being the showman that I am, I actually recreated this whole hanging about seven or eight years ago, right here on this spot. I went by old newspaper clippings, found out exactly where the gallows was, rebuilt it. Um, uh, theirs was on August the 3rd. Mine was on August the 3rd. Theirs was at 6.20 in the morning. Mine was at 6.20 in the afternoon because I didn't think they were going to show up in the morning. And there was about 300 people in this parking lot to show up to watch this thing. While Wilcher was incarcerated, he became a born-again Christian. Now, folks, when they led him up onto the gallows, he wasn't a bit nervous because if you really, really believe to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so, he stood there, ready to meet his maker. The executioner put the noose around his neck. The sheriff asked him if he had any last words. He said no, which was technically his last word. Pulled the lever, the body fell, a neck snapped, and another soul wettered into eternity. Now, I happen to know That woman there is standing about exactly where it happened. Yes, you. <laughs> That's my favorite address. Folks, we're outside of Lawyer's Row. This building right here was built in 1846, probably before any of y'all were even born. It's been here a long time. Now, this used to be an apartment complex for Washington College students. Y'all ever heard of Washington College? 2001. It didn't have to be the stroke of midnight. You could come here, and you might catch the glimpse of something running through the out of the corner of your eye, it just something, a glimpse, a, just a flash. Some people would say that they could smell that smell of a wet dog on these wet days we've been having. Some people saw what they thought was a real dog. They said, come here, boy, and they reached out, try to pet this dog, and they couldn't quite connect with it. They came up here and saw where the dog had run up these steps. And by the time they got over here, that dog was gone, as if someone was at the top of those steps and opened up and closed that door. There weren't nobody up there, folks. October. In case y'all want to, you know, interest, come out next week when we do Halloween week, you know, starting Thursday night, the ghost tour, where we meet at the visitor center for Halloween week. I'm sorry, what are we doing here tonight? Yes. Oh, yeah. Take advantage of every moment. 
This is a friend of mine named Bruce. He's with the Playboy Channel. He's doing. <laughs> He's looking for new prospects. <laughs> now, folks, we're here in this alley. He's with us in the level. But anyway, uh, we're here. At, now, folks, this area is not as pleasant as some of the other places we've been to. Has you know? But I told you it was a cat story, and cats are non-biased. They're gonna. They're gonna. You know, come into the alleys and ghosts are non-biased and they're going to haunt wherever the event took place and you know capture them looking for free meals and so forth and here they are i bet you they didn't show you this alley on any brochures or websites when they were promoting lexington did they <laughs> no here we are now this area right here that building it's called sweet treats it's a great place to go to get a, a sandwich uh or, or, or a drink i used to work there back in 1984 when it was called lords of lexington now, folks, this is the second time I mentioned the 80s tonight. Now, let me tell you all something about the 80s. That was my time. All right? I graduated in 1979, and I was thrust into the 80s. We didn't know what we were in for. It was a crazy time, wasn't it? All right? Amen. Now, folks, not only was it a crazy time, but when you're a young person going into something like that, that that's, that's like a, a double whammy because we didn't know what was around the corner. There was a lot of scary things that happened in the 80s. There was a lot of fun times, but remember some of the scary characters. Boy George. <laughs> <laughs> hey, extremely rare for this part of the country. According to old Scottish and Indian folklore, that means a great spirit has been accepted into the heavens. Mr. Coons didn't care about none of that mumbo jumbo because he was the town's undertaker. It was his job to make sure everybody, and I mean every body, looked good. <laughs> this wasn't just anybody. This was Robert E. Lee, probably the most famous man in America back then. He wanted to give him the grand send-off. All the bells and whistles. The only oh problem God, is, is Mr. Orb. Coons kept all his inventory down in a warehouse down by the North River, now known as the Mari River. Did I mention how hard it rained? Uh -huh. Yes, everything got washed away, including the coffins. And folks, back in those days, you just couldn't get on Amazon and have a coffin delivered the next day. <laughs> I don't know, does Amazon have coffins? Yes, it's at Walmart. Oh, okay, thanks for the information. <laughs> say I've been in a lot of cemeteries because you guys know I like to 
visit them like at Tonopah and so forth but this is probably like really hollow ground or something I don't know how you would say it but it's it, it was spooky last night of course we had a bunch of people so it was probably not as spooky when you're you know with a bunch of people but it still was a little spooky what was interesting was that General Paxton who's laid to rest right here but died at Chancellorville um, is buried in the same place that Stonewall Jackson was buried and Stonewall Jackson actually died in Chancellorville too at the hands of his own men Stonewall Jackson um, at the Battle of Chancellorsville, they, Robert E. Lee and him were really outnumbered, but Lee came up with a plan to divide his troops in the face of the enemy and basically loop all the way around, have Stonewall Jackson take his troop loop all the way around to, to the back uh, of the Union troops and attack and it was actually pretty successful they won the day uh, but Stonewall Jackson was kind of upset because he was it got dark he wasn't able to finish up his attack so he was determined to get the job done so he went out was riding with his uh, couple officers to see if there was a way that they could finish off this attack at night. And uh, as he was going through, you know, the Confederates and the Union soldiers both had sentries put up so that if anybody was coming along, they would uh, alert the enemy, sometimes open fire if they, they knew it was cavalry of the other, other uh, forces. But this time they opened fire on their own general General Stonewall Jackson and a couple days later he passed away as they were leaving he said let us go rest underneath the shade trees and uh, then he passed away so pretty interesting story passed away at Chancellorville they brought him here and they have a memorial to him as well So, what they did with uh, Stonewall Jackson after he uh, died at Chancellorville, they buried him over there where we were, but then they pulled the tombs up, bodies up, and buried him over here. So, now a lot of the family's buried with him right here. And tell us what happens last night while we're looking in the dark, Tina. Oh, well, with the light of the sky behind his statue here, it wasn't light, but it was just the night sky. He focused on his face, head area for just a short period of time. Like, you could literally see his head kind of move from side to side. Like a quick motion, like he's just looking to his side or over his shoulder to check something. And it, it was very, very strange. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, people say that that happens. And also, the I put it on film, and I think the video, I hadn't edited it yet, but I think you can see it. It looks like he's doing that, but um, it, you know, it could be an illusion, but right. it's pretty and crazy. Right, it may be your eyes. Yeah. So. The light of Guys, this is really cool because uh, William Ruffner was the first superintendent of schools in Virginia. And it's cool because when I taught at William Fleming years ago, and William Fleming was, was a colonel at, uh, and they're called the William Fleming Colonels today, he was a colonel uh, at the battle of Point Pleasant, which we did a video of the Mothman and Point Pleasant. Check that out, it's really cool. And then here lies William Ruffner, which 
William Ruffner Middle School was right next door to William Fleming. So that's really cool. We're in Lexington, Virginia, and he's buried right here. Pretty interesting. Robert E. Lee was one of the early leaders of this church and in 1870 right before his death uh, they started uh, building this church and they named it Robert E. Lee Memorial Church. The funny thing was he had come over and we're in the sun so we're dark. The funny thing was um, Robert E. Lee was over here, walked into the church, was listening to some organ music and started having some pain in his arm. Uh, and he made it home, which is right over here. That was his home right up there. He was the president of Washington and Lee College. It was Washington College and he was they asked him to be the president after the Civil War of Washington College. Later on they changed it to Washington and Lee College. Um, so Robert E. Lee was prominent in Lexington. He once he had going back, I was telling you about the stroke that he had, he went out, he made it home, but he died at home and then he was ended up actually being buried at Virginia Military Institute and uh, not sure we're gonna to get to that today, but it's pretty interesting. Uh, it's just right that way, but mm -hmm. wants to see the yep. places. Yep. Very much. So we're gonna walk up and look at the house and where Traveler was. Definitely a beautiful setting for a church, it, and it's a beautiful day. October in Virginia, Lexington, Virginia. Right here was Robert E. Lee's house. So behind me was basically the garage or the stable doors where they kept Robert E. Lee's horse named Traveler. Now Traveler uh, passed away and then Robert E. Lee passed away. I'm not sure who passed away first, but um, 
Robert E. Lee used to take him out and walk through the town all the time. He loved his horse. So, but when uh, they both passed away, Robert E. Lee's wife kept hearing uh, like hoof prints all the time. And she then made a determination that these doors have to always be left open for Traveler to come home so that he could go into his stables. And that's why they're open now. They've been left open ever since the 1870s. Tina has an update to my story. Not, I don't know if it's really an update, but I think that Robert E. Lee actually, actually passed before his horse, Traveler. I can't remember exactly how long it was, um, but that's when his wife made a determination because after he passed, she could still hear his hoof steps or what, what you call it um, and wanted to make sure he, like you said, always found his way home. But I think Robert E. Lee passed first. So, if you're ever in Lexington, there's a lot of good restaurants, a lot of history, uh, and you don't want to miss the ghost tour. I'm serious, it's a really funny, but informative tour. And Mark Klein, the basically a street performer, is pretty daggone good. One of the best uh, tour guides I've ever had on a ghost tour. So don't miss it. Now, behind me is where a giant of a man uh, named Phil Nunn lived. He was about six foot four and he earned about <clears throat> a dollar a day, <clears throat> excuse me, doing odd jobs throughout Lexington. And, uh, and then also, uh, because he was such of a giant of a man, people would, he would sell photographs, uh, postcard photographs of himself and sign them. But, uh, he would take the money that he earned on the odd jobs and he would store them in a little box uh, inside of his bedroom. Well, somehow somebody found out that Phil was saving up his money. He's a pretty quiet guy, didn't talk a lot, but some people figured out that he had some money saved up. So, uh, but they stole it so he decided to come up with a better way to hide his money so he put them in the put the money in the planks in the floor of his room and about seven months went by he didn't check on him and all this money and what he found later when he finally put his hand in there to get just to count his money he found out it was all confetti so I mean, that's a sad story. So anyway, um, he then started having to be paid in silver dollars. And he'd walk around with his bag of silver dollars through town. Nobody's going to mess with him. You know, he's six foot four and he's a big, big man. Wouldn't hurt a flea, they say, but he was just protecting his money. Um, so that story was told on the ghost tour. I'm leaving out some other stuff, so you might want to go on the ghost tour one day, but that's a pretty good story about the giant of a man, Phil Nunn. They call him Phil Dixie Nunn. And, uh, oh, the other sad thing was that he lost his toes because of frostbite. So he would walk around on these big planked shoes, like boards, and he'd strap, wear his socks, and he'd strap his feet on these boards. So when he walked through town, it was clunk clunk clink clink with his money and uh so that was pretty scary so if you hear you're in lexington and you hear the clunk clunk clink clink it's probably mr nunn <laughs>